Okay, uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's event, the fifth lecture of the Ayn Rand Institute's 2006 lecture series. My name is Mark Chapman and I am the Vice President of Development for the Institute, which is headquartered here in Irvine, California. The Ayn Rand Institute is a nonprofit organization and all of our programs are funded by private donations from corporations, foundations, and the generosity of many individuals throughout the United States and around the world. We are now actively seeking funding for more of these talks, so if you appreciate the value of this series and would like to see it continue, please consider becoming a supporter of the Institute and perhaps of this series specifically. Uh, if you're interested, please see me tonight and I'll be happy to give you more information. Now a few brief announcements before we begin tonight's lecture. We have a bookstore located in the back of this room with a selection of Ayn Rand's fiction and nonfiction writings and other books and recordings on politics, foreign policy, and terrorism related to tonight's talk. We would also like to announce that the last lecture of this year's series will be held here at the Hyatt on Wednesday, October the 18th, entitled Religion and Morality. The lecture will be presented by Dr. Ankar Gatte of the Ayn Rand Institute. Next month, from October 20th through 22nd, which is on a three-day weekend in Boston, the Institute will be hosting a conference entitled The Jihad Against the West, The Real Threat and the Right Response. The three-day event will conclude with a talk by tonight's speaker as part of the historic Ford Hall Forum Lecture Series. Other featured speakers will include Daniel Pipes, director of the Middle East Institute, excuse me, the Middle East Forum, Fleming Rose, editor of Gillen's Posten, which is the Danish newspaper uh, that published the Muhammad cartoons, and there was quite a controversy around that uh, recently, and uh, Robert Spencer, director of Jihad Watch. For anyone in the San Diego area, uh, ARI's Lon Giorno will be presenting a campus club lecture on Islam's role in the terror war on America on October 26th at the U University of San Diego campus, campus. Please visit the ARI website for more information. For those interested in taking courses at ARI, two new courses just starting up are just starting up in our Objectivist Academic Center, which are available for auditing. One is detailed, a detailed study of Ayn Rand's philosophy, and the other is on the history of capitalism. Details, including information on how to register, can be found on the ARI website. Okay, that's it for the announcements. Our uh, speaker tonight is Dr. Yaron Brook, President and Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute. As a nationally recognized expert on current political events, including foreign policy issues such as terrorism and the Middle East conflict, Dr. Brooke is regularly interviewed by the print, radio, and television media. He is currently a regular guest on several CNBC business programs, including On the Money, Closing Bell, and Cudlow and Company, where he comments on cultural and business-related issues. He also lectures on terrorism and issues related to the Middle East, at college campuses throughout the U.S., including recent talks at Brown University, Columbia, Stanford, and NYU. Prior to coming to the United States, Dr. Brooks served in the Israeli Armed Forces, including assignments as a member of the Israeli Army Intelligence. He was also an award-winning university professor at Santa Clara University before joining the Ayn Rand Institute in 2000. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Democracy Versus Victory, why the forward strategy of freedom had to fail. At the end of the lecture, Dr. Brooke will be joined by Dr. Ankar Gatte, Dean of the Objectivist Academic Center at the Ayn Rand Institute. And they'll be fielding questions from the audience. So if you have a question at that time, please step up to the mic, which is located here in this aisle, um, and they'll be happy to answer your question. And now please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Yaron Brooke. Uh, thank you. Let me, uh, given the cell phone just rang, uh, let me remind everybody to uh, turn your cells off, please. Thank you. In the five years since September 11th, many people have asked despondently if the United States is safer. While there has been little reason to feel more secure, about a year ago, many were swept up uh, in excitement 
of the government's new strategy in the Middle East. Some people were euphoric with hope. We all saw an early milestone of that strategy in January of 2005. We saw the images of smiling Iraqis displaying their ink-stained fingers, having just cast their votes in elections in liberated Iraq. Those images, people said, symbolized a momentous development. We all heard the breathless news reports about a wave of democracy in the Middle East. After the voting, President Bush said the balloting was a resounding success and praised Iraqis who, quote, have taken rightful control of their country's destiny, unquote. The hope and excitement sparked by elections in Iraq was contagious. Even opponents of Bush were swept up. A New York Times editorial, for example, declared that the first three months of 2005 had been full of, quote, heartening surprises, each one remarkable in itself, and taken together truly astonishing, that Bush administration is entitled to claim a healthy share of the credit for many of these advances. Now, this is the New York Times. Even Ted Kennedy hailed the development. Commentators saw reason to believe Bush's prediction of 2003. He had said that, quote, Iraqi democracy will succeed, that it would be a watershed event in the global democratic revolution, unquote. Indeed, in an Arab League meeting in Tunis, according to Reuters, heads of state, quote, promised to promote democracy, expand popular participation in politics, and reinforce women's and civil society. Later, U.S. pressure nudged Syria to withdraw from Lebanon and Egypt to hold the first contested elections in many years. The upshot of all this, we were told, would be greater security for America. The crusade to dem democratize the greater Middle East was premised on the idea that, to quote Bush, the security of our nation depends on the advance of liberty in other nations, unquote. This is Bush's so-called forward strategy for freedom. Bringing democracy to the rest of the world for the alleged purpose of making America safer. So what is the situation today, just what, about a year and a half after these elections, these first elections? They have indeed been elections across the Middle East, but they have made us less safe. To understand this point, we must realize who the enemy is, who the enemy that struck us on 9-11 is. It is not terrorism, as the administration claimed in the days and years after 9-11. The enemy is Islamic totalitarianism, the ideology that would enslave the entire Middle East and the rest of the world under a totalitarian state ruled by Islamic law. These totalitarians will use whatever means necessary to attain their goal. Terrorism, if they think it will be effective. All-out war, if they can win. Politics, if it will gain them control over whole countries. So who won the elections? in Iraq, the elections that were touted as such an American victory. Well, the new government is dominated by a Shiite alliance led by Skiri. That stands for the Supreme Council for an Islamic Revolution in Iraq. The alliance, the Shiite alliance, whose spiritual leader is an Ayatollah, Ayatollah Sistani, has in, uh, intimate ties with the first nation to undergo an Islamic revolution, Iran. The fundamental principle of Iraq's new constitution is Islam. One of the most powerful men in Iraqi politics today is the hugely popular religious warlord, Mukhtar al sadr whose Mahdi army committed itself to armed resistance against America and has killed many American troops. The siege 
of Najaf in 2004 was intended to disarm Sada's uh, private militia. It was a siege that failed because of America's unwillingness to offend the Shiites. The Iraqi quagmire has so far claimed nearly 3,000 American lives. Iraq has become what it was never before, a hotbed of Islamic terrorists. Consider the Palestinian territories. For years, Bush has begged Palestinians to elect, quote, new leaders not compromised by terror, unquote. When Palestinians finally had the opportunity to elect new leaders in January 2006, they did turn their backs on the cronies of Yasser Arafat. Instead, they voted in even more militant killers, the Hamas, the Islamic totalitarian group notorious for suicide bombings. It won a landslide election and now rules the Palestinian territories. Earlier this summer, the Iranian-backed Hamas and Hezbollah killed and kidnapped Israeli soldiers and precipitated a war in the region. Now, Hezbollah, I will remind you, took part in a U.S.-endorsed elections in Lebanon and is now part of the Lebanese government. Hezbollah is an Islamic totalitarian group. And it runs two ministries, two ministries in the Lebanese government. Consider as a final example of the trend, the elections in Egypt. In the Arab world's most populous country, voters turned out despite government bullying and interference. And it was hailed as a you know, victory for democracy. Now, which group scored the most significant gains? The Muslim Brotherhood, which is the fountainhead of the Islamic totalitarian movement. Hamas and parts of Al-Qaeda, as well as many other Islamic totalitarian groups, sprang from the Muslim Brotherhood. The group's founding credo is, quote, Allah is our goal, the Quran is our constitution, the prophet is our leader, struggle is our way, and death in the path of Allah is our highest aspiration, unquote. The Brotherhood's success was considerable. It won 88 seats in the Egyptian assembly. With 20% in the assembly, it is the largest opposition block the body has ever seen. Yet it could have won many, many more seats, but deliberately chose to field only 125 candidates to limit its own success and avoid a crackdown from the government. Indeed, government troops were sent out to block voting in areas where they could have won even more. Across the Middle East, there is a renewed sense of purpose and greater confidence among Islamic totalitarians, from Beirut to Gaza to Cairo to Tehran. Hezbollah's war against Israel this summer is one major symptom of that confidence. The situation today is worse for America than it was right after 9-11. Witness the numerous terrorist plots that make the headlines, such as the one recently uncovered by British police to blow up airlines crossing the Atlantic. Few people today feel safer because, in fact, America is not safer. With the disaster in Iraq and a worsening situation in the greater Middle East, many Americans have lost confidence in Bush's forward strategy. And the White House has come under heavy criticism. What went wrong, according to these critics? Well, the so-called realists in foreign policy don't explain what went wrong. Instead, they dismiss the forward strategy as hopeless from the outset. The so -called, to so-called realists, freedom is just one value among others, and it is not America's job to judge other regimes. Instead, they say, you know, we should broker deals with whomever it is, experience, it, it is expedient to befriend for the moment, regardless of whether they're dictatorships or free countries. That supposedly is the way to secure Americans' interests. But of course, this is false. Freedom is an objectively superior value. 
And it is a losing strategy to appease and cozy up with hostile regimes. Other criticisms come down to this. The disaster in the Middle East is due to some failure in the execution of the forward strategy. We didn't send enough troops to Iraq. Uh, there were not enough guards along the Iraq's border with Syria. Uh, Iraqi police forces are not sufficiently trained and, and the equipment is not as good, etc., etc. You can take it from here. Similar criticisms have been put forward about Afghanistan. Too few troops, too little knowledge of the local language, and on and on. Much of the criticism is centered on the concrete means of the strategy, but not on its ends. But perhaps the strategy's end is the problem. Perhaps nothing went wrong. And what we're seeing in the Middle East is the fulfillment of the forward strategy's actual goal. My thesis tonight is that this strategy had to fail at making us safer. Because making us safer was never its purpose. And since its actual goal is perverse, the forward strategy undermines America's security. This self-destructive outcome is a necessary outcome of the forward strategy of freedom's immoral aims, goals. So let's begin with a question that the architects of the strategy had to begin with immediately after 9-11. What must America do to defend itself, given the lethal threat posed by Islamic terrorists? What steps are necessary to achieve our security, to protect our lives? The rational answer is, America must defeat the enemy. Defeating the enemy entails the permanent elimination of the threat, the complete restoration and protection of individual rights, the return to normal life without endless terror alerts and the dread of another 9-11. Now that has been the objective measure of success in war throughout history, victory. It was the goal of the Allied powers in World War II, and they did indeed succeed. The combat in World War II achieved victory over Germany and restored peace. By 1945, when the war ended, the Germans and Japanese were defeated. People in the West sigh, breathed a sigh of relief and return to their normal lives. The threat was over. How was this victory accomplished? Well, the Allied powers committed themselves to crushing Germany. They carpet bombed German cities, pulverized its factories and railroads, devastated its infrastructure, and demonstrated that the Nazi cause was doomed. In the Pacific theater, the United States thoroughly defeated Japan. Ultimately, that necessitated dropping two atomic bombs, which, which spared the lives of countless US troops who would otherwise have died in the continued fighting. So to achieve victory, the United States crushed and humiliated the enemy, proving the ideologies of Nazism and Japanese imperialism impotent and suicidal. Today, the U.S. could defeat the enemy by doing the same to those regimes, advocating the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism. Military force could be used to devastate them until our will dominates. We can thus bring their hostilities to an end and fulfill our legitimate and urgent need for security. The chief targets are the intellectual and financial sponsors of Islamic terrorism, Saudi Arabia and Iran which is now, of course, chasing nuclear weapons. Now, there are tactical options in prosecuting such a war, but such a war is necessary to defeat the enemy and end the threat to our lives. Victory in the war on Islamic totalitarianism requires no less than it did in World War II. It requires the destruction and humiliation of the enemy and its ideology. But according to the Bush administration, the steps that America must take are very different. 
President Bush claimed that, quote, we're advancing our security at home by advancing the cause of freedom across the world. Because in the long run, the only way to defeat the terrorists is to break their dark vision of hatred and fear by offering them hopeful alternatives of human freedom. The security of our nation depends on the advance of liberty in other nations, unquote. Oh, he adds, helping the people of Iraq is the morally right thing to do, and it is also in our own national interest, unquote. This, then, is the strategy that alleges, allegedly is indispensable to American security. The Ford strategy will work, Bush claimed, because it seeks to prevent the conditions that enable terrorists to operate and thrive. Quoting Bush again, dictatorships shelter terrorists and feed resentment and radicalism and threaten the security of free nations. We know throughout history that democracies can replace resentment with hope and rep respect the rights of their citizens and our neighbors and join together to fight in this global war against terrorism. History has shown that free nations are peaceful nations, unquote. Boil this down, and this is what you find. Unless we bring democracy to the Muslim world, we will suffer more attacks like 9-11. We can stop such attacks and make Americans safe, America safer by toppling dictatorships and fostering elections in the Middle East. So the alternatives are don't spread democracy and be massacred, or end tyranny in the Middle East and be safe. Now, this might sound plausible. Truly free nations have no interest in waging war on others, except in self-defense. Free nations prosper through trade, not conquest and plunder. Peace is good for them. War is not. It is also true that the more free countries there are in the world, the better off we are. But would this strategy promoting democracy as, as the, as the uh, main uh, vehicle for defending America, would the strategy have sounded plausible as a response to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Imagine that following Pearl Harbor, Americans were told that victory would come not by fighting the enemy until, it, until its unconditional surrender, no, but by bringing democracy to Asia and Europe. Imagine that our goal in the war was declared to be liberating poor Japanese and Germans from enslavement by their rulers. Imagine that U.S. bombers dropped aid packages on German and Japanese cities in between delicate sprinkles of missiles. Because this was, was not the approach taken, World War II was won decisively in less than four years after Pearl Harbor. We are now entering the sixth year of Bush's war, and there is no end in sight. Things are only getting worse. After Pearl Harbor, the outraged people of America demanded self-assertive retaliation, and their government delivered. Likewise, right after 9-11, people were righteously outraged. Their healthy, rational response was, we need to fight a war now to make us safer. The administration also felt outraged. It famously announced that we must, quote, end states who support terrorism, unquote. The original name of the military campaign in Afghanistan was aptly chosen, Operation Infinite Justice, signaling that it was proper for America to assert its own interests, proper for us to defend ourselves. Put into words, the mood came to this. It was America's moral right to defend itself, to secure its own interests. But that initial response to 9-11 did not last. It was not translated into any military strategy for victory. The idea that it is right for America to be self-interested, that did not last. Operation Infinite Justice was renamed to something blandly differential. The nation's willingness to defeat the enemy evaporated. Why? Because the initial response that self-interest is proper clashed with people's more deeply held belief about what is morally good. 
This is where the forward strategy comes in. This strategy reflects and is motivated by the dominant moral code in our country, altruism. From secular and religious authorities, left and right, we are urged that to be moral is to give up your values in selfless service to others. We hear it constantly. Serve in a cause larger than yourself, and whatever you do, don't be selfish. According to this creed, our duty is to put other people first and subordinate or renounce our own values. According, uh, according to this creed, Mother Teresa is a moral hero, but a productive businessman like Bill Gates is not. Unless, of course, he repents and gives his way away his billions of dollars. Who must, must we serve? Well, whoever is deemed needy, whoever lacks a value, like liberty or wealth. And on this standard, the oppressed, impoverished, primitive Iraqis are definitely have-nots. Although bringing them democracy would be hard, Bush said, quote, that is no excuse to leave the Iraqi regime's torture chambers and poison labs in operation, unquote. Why? Because as Bush stated, we Americans know how to, quote, sacrifice for the liberty of strangers, unquote. Now, it is important to understand Bush's statement precisely. Sacrifice does not mean giving up something unimportant for the sake of a big reward at the end, like scrimping and saving today in order to buy a car next year. That's not sacrifice. When we serve others, we should do it for their sake, their benefit, not for any gain we hope for as a result. To sacrifice means to give up a value for the sake of a lesser or non-value. It means renouncing benefits now, but for no greater benefit ever. It means scrimping and saving today and handing your savings over to a stranger. It means sending American soldiers to Iraq not to defend their own liberty and ours, but to ensure Iraqis have functioning sewers. It means a net loss. And the cardinal value that America must sacrifice is its own national security, the defense of our lives from Islamic terrorists. The Ford strategy thus demands that we put aside America's rightful need for security and instead sacrifice for strangers all across the globe, wherever tyranny rules. The goal of the democracy crusade is not to end the threats arrayed against us, but to bring unearned benefits to the world's hungry and oppressed. Facing catastrophic threats to the lives of Americans, how did the administration respond? Well, guided by its moral premises, the administration did not ask itself what must be done to protect the country. Instead, it asked, how can America best serve strangers in need. The forward strategy is not concerned with defeating, defeating the enemy at all. It is a substitute for achieving victory. And that is exactly how Washington directed the entire war. From the outset, the war was pitched as a war of liberation. Just as we toppled the Taliban to liberate the Afghans, so we toppled Saddam to liberate the Iraqis. The campaign in Iraq, after all, was called Operation Iraqi Freedom, not American security. Shock and awe, the supposedly merciless bombing of Baghdad never materialized. That's because, as Washington demanded, the military's goal was not to devastate Iraq's infrastructure, but to provide welfare services. Bush had promised that America will stand uh, will, quote, stand ready to help the citizens of a liberated Iraq. We will deliver medicine to the sick, and we are now moving into place nearly three million emergency rations to feed the hungry, unquote. The fighting had hardly begun when Washington launched the so-called reconstruction. Our military was ordered to commit troops 
and resources which were needed to defend military personnel to the tasks of reopening schools, printing textbooks, fixing up hospitals. For the Iraqis, Washington laid on food and medicine, schools and sewers, but of course it tied, at the same time, it tied the hands of its own military. Washington commanded the military to tiptoe around Iraq. Troops were coached in all sorts of cultural sensitivity training so that they would not offend the primitive customs of the locals. The military had to avoid treading in holy shrines in order not to bomb high-priority targets such as power stations. The welfare of Iraqis was placed above the lives of our soldiers. These soldiers were put in line of fire, but prevented from using all necessary force in order to protect themselves and win the war. Many of our servicemen died as a result. Washington treats the lives of our military personnel as expendable. Their blood is spilt for the sake of serving Iraqis, a people overwhelmingly hostile to America. Bush had committed America to the selfless mission in the run-up to the war. Speaking early in 2003, he said, quote, the first to benefit from a free Iraq would be the Iraqi people themselves. They live in scarcity and fear under a dictator who has brought them nothing but war and misery and torture. Their lives and their freedom matter little to Saddam Hussein. But Iraqi lives and freedom matter greatly to us, unquote. Their lives did matter greatly to Washington. They mattered far more so than the lives of security of Americans. Now this is mandated, this approach, by the self-sacrificial morality guiding the forward strategy. For Bush and other advocates of the forward strategy, America has a moral duty to spread democracy globally. We must sacrifice for strangers, not just in Iraq or Afghanistan, but wherever tyranny exists. Promoting democracy across the world is supposedly America's destiny. For Bush, this is a religious mission that God has conferred upon us. Bush elaborated, quote, We are confident that history has an author who fills time and eternity with his purpose. We did not ask for this mission, yet there is honor in history's call. Advancing these ideals is the mission that created our nation. It is the calling of our time. Now pause to contemplate what it means in concrete terms to say that America has a calling, a moral duty to the world's oppressed people. Project what that means in practice, given the nightmare that Iraq has become and the onerous cost of the war so far. Hundreds of thousands of US troops have fought in the wars since 9-11. In Iraq, at the peak, as many as 300,000 of our military were involved. Today, about 140,000 troops are stuck in the quagmire that exists there today. The war effort since 9-11 has cost us about $368 billion, with Iraq costing $261 billion. About 2,600 brave Americans have come home dead in body bags. Nearly 20,000 have come home burned, blinded, limping. They are returning wounded, both physically and psychologically. The casualties of the war are largely unseen, but they are real. And for what? Contemplate what advocates of American destiny are calling for. It is not just one nightmare like Iraq, which is horrendous in itself, but dozens of conflicts that grind up American men and women and drain the lifeblood from our civilization. And not for a few months, but indefinitely, as we fulfill the open-ended calling of our time. Now, this is morally obscene. We are told that fulfilling such a destiny will boost our national greatness not protect the lives of individual Americans, but boost some clouding 
cloudy, free-floating conception of U.S. greatness. This implies selfless campaigns to reshape, reshape other countries by any available means. President Bush is doing his part to fulfill America's destiny, not only in Iraq. Despite a shortage of military recruits, U.S. troops remain as so-called peacekeepers in Kosovo, Bosnia, and dozens of other places around the world. On top of this, America funnels vast amount of money in charitable donations to other countries. Note the response last year to the terrorist attacks in London. Remember the, the subways blowing up. The response was not a commitment to destroying the enemy, but instead at the G8 meeting that was being held at the same time as the terrorist attack happened in Scotland, Bush pledged uh, to ramp up American foreign aid, promising billions of dollars to the poor and oppressed of Africa and the Middle East. This is, a, this is their answer to the terrorist attack that had happened a day earlier. To make all this seem palatable and practical, advocates of the strategy rationalize their selfless campaign by pitching it as pro-American. This stuff about destiny, they tout as patriotism. They declare that such missions build and enhance our collective national identity. Such missions supposedly add to our glory as a people. But this is not patriotism. It is crude nationalism of the kind spouted by fascists in the last century. Underneath the rationalizations is the perverse code of self-sacrifice, the demand that Americans put their own interests aside for the sake of the nation, for the sake of strangers abo abroad, always renouncing our own individual interests. But this vicious notion contradicts the individualist's origin of America. This country was the first to conceive of itself as the land of free men. Not of men chained by the nose to the clan, the tribe, the race, or the nation. Each individual American is sovereign and independent, owing no duty to serve others. He is the master of his own life, not the slave to a nation or destiny. That was the premise that inspired the founding fathers. Anyone who understands that would reject calls to serve America's destiny in Iraq or anywhere. Americans are not yet a people who respond favorably to blatant calls to self-sacrifice. So advocates of altruistic policies typically package self-sacrifice as a sensible, self-interested policy. For example, they tell us that if we want safer streets and less crime, the government must re redistribute our wealth from the productive to those who have not earned it. Likewise, to make the forward strategy appealing, the advocates must deceive the public. They claim that if you want to make America safer, we must sacrifice US troops in a global democratic crusade. But if the goal were truly to make America more secure, Defeating our enemies would have to have been priority one. Victory is the precondition of American security. We do need to ensure the defeated enemy remain a non-threat once we've defeated it. But logically, the question of what political system is set up in a defeated country can only arise after one has eliminated the threat and the enemy has been demoralized and defeated. The forward strategy, however, sacrifices the goal of being victorious over the enemy. Instead, the strategy substitutes the goal of spreading democracy, spread democracy instead of victory. But even on its own terms, by advocating democracy, in other words, unlimited majority rule, the forward strategy is a vicious fraud. This should be clear to anyone who truly understands what freedom is. While claiming to champion freedom, the strategy has nothing to do with it. The truth is exactly the opposite. The Ford strategy encourages tyranny and is an assault on the freedom of Americans. Freedom, in a political context, means the absence of physical coercion. 
it is so profound a value because in order to eat and earn a living, to build cars and perform surgery, in order to live, man must think and act on the judgment of his own rational mind. In order to take that action, he must be left alone, left free from the interference of the government and of other men. The moral foundation of freedom is respect for the sovereignty of the individual and his right to exist for his own sake. Because the founding fathers understood this, they created a constitutional republic, enshrining the protection of individual rights, the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Our constitutional framework prohibits the majority from voting away the rights of anyone. The founders firmly rejected democracy. Democracy rests on the primacy of the group. If your gang is large enough, you can get away with whatever you want, sacrificing the life and wealth of whoever stands in your way. A democracy is majority rule, unlimited by moral principle. It is a form of tyranny. Now observe that spreading democracy is an inherent part of the forward strategy. The reason is that the system of democracy is an efficient means of selflessly serving others. To serve America's self-interest would mean that we decided the political makeup of a defeated regime, how it is made permanently non-threatening. We would be better off and safer if we could ensure that we don't have to face a resurgent threat in a country we've waged war to defeat. But Washington disavows any intention of deciding this issue. You know, what, pol what political regime will be in place. Bush proclaimed all along that America would never determine the precise character of Iraq's new regime. The decision was entirely theirs. That's what democracy is. Whatever these Iraqis choose, America would endorse selflessly. When asked if the U.S. would accept an election that brought to power an Iranian-style militant theocracy in the new Iraq, Bush said, yes. He explained that, quote, democracy is democracy, unquote. Why should America sit back and accept a new hostile regime in Iraq, a worse threat to our security than Saddam Hussein was? Why? Because whatever the Iraqis dictate goes. Their will must be sovereign. Their desire must come first, above any American interest. We must sacrifice our legitimate need for security, our prerogative to render and keep Iraq peaceful, in order to satisfy the will of the majority of poor, weak Iraqis. Anything else would be selfish. You can see what drives the strategy. America is free, wealthy, and strong. And thus, on the morality of self-sacrifice, we must serve others, not ourselves. You can also see why democracy is a necessary political expression of this morality. By this means, Iraqis and Afghans can decide and dictate to us what they want. It makes their interests paramount. Giving them a democracy puts their interests ahead of ours. It is perfectly selfless. Now, that this strategy is patently hostile to American interests it should be clear to anyone knowledgeable about the culture of the Middle East. The Bush administration wished to believe that Iraqis and other people in the region yearn for freedom and prosperity, just as Americans do. And that if America liberated them, these people would embrace us and the supposedly self-evident value of liberty. Only by self-delusion could anyone come to believe this stuff. Only by self-delusion could they evade the religious, mystical, collectivistic, tribal nature of so much of Islamic culture in the Middle East. The results of elections in the Middle East have exposed the truth. The undefeated people did speak. And what they clamored for are Islamist leaders hostile to the West. That is what happened in the Palestinian territories with Hamas, in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, and it is likely to happen as well in Jordan, 
when that country has elections next year at Washington's urging. Islamists who are closely tied to Iran now hold power in Iraq. The forward strategy of freedom has left the enemy undefeated and much stronger, with its path to political power paved by Washington. Note Iran's glee at events and how boldened they feel. Absurdly, after five years of war, America now faces a threat that we help make more potent, more dangerous. This is precisely what the Ford strategy must lead to, given its moral premises and what, it promo what its promoters evaded. The strategy means sacrificing American lives, not merely for the sake of indifferent strangers, but for the sake of our enemy. Bringing democracy to the world requires sacrificing the lives and liberties of Americans. The troops who risk their lives are not fighting to protect our and their liberty. They fight so that Iraqis and Afghans can have mob rule and elect Islamists to power. The forward strategy requires violating the rights of Americans so that hostile peoples can form new regimes that threaten our lives and freedom. By endorsing democracy, Bush's strategy teaches the enemy a profoundly encouraging lesson that America does not fight to defeat the enemy, it does not stand for its own interests, but renounces them on principle. America does all this so that people across the Middle East can have their desires for Islamist regimes fulfilled. To our enemies, America is a paper tiger, in spite of its unsurpassed military strength, because it lacks conviction that it has the right to exist and defend its own values. Morally, the forward strategy of freedom is irredeemable. It should be clear why the strategy had to fail at making us safer. Victory was never its goal. What then would a strategy of victory look like? What would a strategy that truly embraced freedom demand? A strategy for victory, the defeat of an enemy threat, necessitates an entirely different orientation from Bush's strategy. A strategy is an integrated plan for achieving some goal. And the choice of the goal ultimately depends on the moral code one holds. The forward strategy is self-destructive because its goal is self-destructive. The strategy is an expression of the morality of self-sacrifice. That fundamental conception of what is morally good shapes every aspect of Bush's strategy. That is what dooms it. A strategy for victory achieves our security because its goal is to achieve our self-interest. Defeating the enemy must be its highest prior purpose. The single-minded commitment flows from the recognition that man has a moral right to his own existence, a right to life, and that it is the U.S. government's obligation to protect the rights of its citizens. This is the moral justification for waging war to defend America's self-interest. That is, to protect, to protect the right of each individual American to live free from the threat of foreign aggression. A strategy for victory rejects the so-called realist approach of balancing powers, of amoral deal-making, of cynical geopolitical chess games. Rather, it is committed to the protection of American lives, not merely in the range of the moment or in a given crisis, but across the span of decades and in every single situation on principle. This strategy is pro-freedom. It's pro-freedom. The freedom of Americans to live unmolested and unharmed by foreign powers. This precludes sending men to fight wars, not for the sake of their own liberty, but selfishly, selflessly. So it precludes selfless wars. A strategy for victory is based on the morality of rational egoism. Because it is guided by a rational moral principle, it is also practical. 
Now, what in concrete terms would a strategy for victory demand? First and foremost, we need to go to war knowing clearly what, that it is moral, that it is morally proper to destroy the enemy. This moral confidence, a certainty in our own moral superiority over the aggressor, a certainty that it is right to end the lives of those who threaten us, this moral confidence is indispensable to the military task. To win, we must know what we are fighting for our own freedom and what means that implies. Before, during, and after combat, U.S. foreign policy must boldly advocate for our ideals. Our government must broadcast that we believe that our own ideals of individualism, political freedom, secular government, laissez-faire capitalism are right, and that defending them is morally good. It must broadcast that the enemy's ideology is morally corrupt and must be stopped. If we are to establish our long-term security, we must demonstrate in practice and in logic that Islamic totalitarianism is a losing ideology leading to death and destruction, while the ideology we fight for is morally good, leading to life and prosperity. America should be an intellectual advocate for freedom. It is in our best interest to encourage others to adopt political and economic freedom. To genuine freedom fighters, we should give our moral endorsement, which in itself is considerable, though often underappreciated. We should, for example, endorse the free Taiwanese who are resisting the claims of authoritarian China to rule the island state. But the advocacy of freedom has an absolute limit. It is never, it is never moral for America to send its troops in order to liberate a people and then pile sacrifice upon sacrifice for the sake of nation building. It is wrong to send troops our troops on humanitarian missions, or to fight wars where America's security is not directly at stake. Such wars are a violation of the rights of us troops who fight to protect our and their liberty. It is also an outrageous squandering of resources that our government is obliged to use only in defense of American lives. America must never sacrifice the freedom of li and lives of its own citizens in the alleged name of promoting freedom. That would be a flagrant self-contradiction. In the Middle East, for the culture to become a non-threat to us forever, the people must accept that attacking the U.S. and its allies will bring them nothing but destruction and death. For them to prosper, they must look to us, not as an enemy, but as a source of knowledge. They need to learn the value of individualism, of political freedom, of individual rights, of laissez-faire capitalism. They need to learn the crucial importance of separating state and religion, of keeping government secular. These are just some of the values they must learn to embrace, the values that have made America great if they wish for peace and prosperity. America has no moral duty to rescue the Arab Islamic world from its own irrational ideals. It is in our rational self-interest to confidently assert our fundamental values and to stand as an exemplar to all who care to learn. Now, how do we translate this confidence in America's moral superiority into military action to defend our values? Well, since the enemy we face is Islamic totalitarianism, the vicious movement that wants to subjugate the West to Islamic rule, we must target the source of this movement. Instead of nation building, of rebuilding infrastructure, of sponsoring elections, of doling out food packages in Iraq and Afghanistan, America must focus its military efforts on Iran and Saudi Arabia. These are the wellsprings of Islamic totalitarianism. 
Iran promotes, sponsors, trains, and arms jihadists. Support for the movement is government policy in Iran. In Saudi Arabia, government support might be passive, but it is substantial. These regimes inspire the terrorists and make the perverse ideal of an Islamic regime appear practical and realizable. Ending these regimes will halt the material support that enables Islamists to wage their jihad, and it will undermine the ideal that inspires them to fight. In the case of Iran, massive force should be used to destroy the Mullah's regimes and their supporters. And it needs to be done now, before the regime acquires nuclear weapons. This is the most urgent step we must take in the war. It is a travesty that nearly 140,000 American troops are stationed miles from the Iranian border, and instead of preparing to invade that country, they're performing social services in Iraq. But in waging war in Iran, we must set aside the self-sacrificial rules of war, the rules of engagement under which our military has fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. If we are to win the war on Islamic totalitarianism, we must crush and demoralize the Iranian regime and all who support it. We must be ready and willing to use whatever force is necessary to achieve this goal. Since victory is our highest priority, since we recognize the, irreplaceability, the irreplaceable value of human life, no military options should be ruled out. Breaking the spine of Iran will demonstrate America's resolute will to combat aggression. With that accomplished, Saudi Arabia will likely capitulate. Such regimes will know that to stay in power, they must not risk incurring America's wrath. Saudi Arabia's capitulation must include an end to the export of Islamic totalitarian ideology. That means no more funding of religious schools and mosques outside Saudi Arabia, no funding of radical Islamic groups anywhere, a stop to the horrific anti-American and anti-Jewish rhetoric in its state mosques. Other problematic regimes, such as Pakistan and Syria, will no longer feel so bold in the face of America. Dealing with them and ending their complicity in terrorism will prove far easier once America's commitments to its self-defense is demonstrated unambiguously. Finally, we need to hunt down the committed jihadists and stop them before they carry out further atrocities. But that is a hopeless task unless we smash their support infrastructure and expose their cause as doomed. Once we do that, they will be increasingly isolated and despondent. They will be far easier targets. What we do after victory is achieved should be guided exclusively by our self-interest. If the enemy is thoroughly destroyed and receptive to a new free political system, it might very well be in our interest to remain and help implement such a system as we did in Japan after World War II. Otherwise, if establishing a culture of freedom would be too costly in dollars and US lives, then we have no moral obligation to pursue such a course. In such a case, we should leave the country in as non-threatening a condition as possible and be clear on the consequence of them becoming a threat to us again. If our potential enemies know without a doubt that the consequence of threatening us is their own destruction, the world will be a peaceful place for Americans. And that, after all, is what we have a government for, to secure peace for us so that we may live and prosper. In foreign policy and other fields, there are supposedly only two mutually exclusive choices. Be idealistic or be practical. So-called realists claim to be practical, while advocates of the forward strategy claim to be moral idealists. Either we engage in amoral deals with hostile regimes for specious gains, or open-ended, self-sacrificial crusades. 
What we need is a radically different foreign policy, one based on the morality of rational egoism. Such a policy unites the moral and the practical. It leads to a strategy that demands victory over the enemy for the sake of our own freedom. In this war, as in all wars to defend America, victory comes first above all else. The Ford strategy is suicidal, and it's suicide, it's suicide deliberately pursued. We are in an ideological battle, first and foremost, a battle about the morality that guides our foreign policy, a battle about the meaning of freedom for Americans, a battle about the meaning of victory, a battle that must be won here in America if we are to beat our enemies overseas. So on the fifth anniversary of 9-11, I call on you all to rededicate yourself to your moral right to life and America's moral right to self-defense. Remember the evil of the attacks on that day and recognize that this is a war. Remember that it is morally proper, indeed morally necessary, that we crush the enemy. Aware that our cause is just, we must help America recapture the spur to righteous action left to us by the brave passengers of Flight 93. Let's roll. Thank you. Uh, Bush identified the enemy as Islamic fascism and was criticized for it. In last night's speech, he identified the enemy as extremism versus moderation. Could you comment? Um, yeah, Bush for a while was identifying the enemy as Islamic fascism. What was it? Uh, uh, almost five years it took him to come to that realization that Islam had something to do with who the enemy was. Uh, and of course fascism is the wrong term uh, because it's really totalitarianism. Fascism is one form of totalitarianism. Um, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no real link between fascism and, and uh, uh, the particular ideology that the Islamists hold. It is a totalitarian ideology like fascism, like communism like other totalitarian ideologies. Uh, so even, even calling it fascism is too narrow. Um, but at least there was Islam in it, you know, which has now disappeared again. And if you read the strategy for victory, which is, was just published a week ago, um, there's no mention. It was yeah, national strategy for combating terrorism. Yeah, the national strategy for combating terrorism, Islam is not mentioned. It's a big, thick document. Islam is not mentioned in the entire document. So they've they walked away even a week ago from the term Islamic anything. Um, and the reason is that they are um, appeasers. They are fundamentally appeasers. So uh, Bush was trying to make a case for why the war was justified, why Iraq was justified, that we're still at war and so on, why uh, you know, all this sacrifice in Iraq was still legitimate. So he was trying to beef up people's, you know, beef up American conscious, conscience consciousness to the war. Um, and I think some of his advisors said, well, Americans have kind of figured out that Islam has something to do with it, so maybe you should use the real term, which is Islamic fascism, which has been used by certain conservatives since day one. Um, so he used it. It was a trial balloon. Uh, immediately after using it, people got really upset. Kay got upset. Muslims got upset. He probably got a phone call from his pal, the prince in Saudi Arabia and probably from the Prime Minister of, uh, of Iraq, who's, after all, an Islamic fascist. 
um, and an ally of the United States in the war on terrorism. In this document, it calls Iraq an ally in the war on terrorism. Um, and, and it leaves, and, and in dealing with Iran, the solution to Iran is to turn them into an ally on the war on terrorism too. Uh, so he, he got criticism from, from everybody. Nobody actually said, what took you so long? Nobody advocates, nobody, you know, so, so he's kind of, at some point, looking at public opinion or looking at what the intellectuals are saying and looking at what phone calls he gets, and he doesn't get any, any from people who are saying, you've been a wimp all along, you know, it's about time you came about, and he gets pushed towards the left. I mean, I've been criticized from day one for criticizing Bush because, oh, you're in league with the New York Times, it's, you know, you're on the left, and so on. And my argument is, even if you think Bush is redeemable, which I don't think, but even if you think that, don't you want a voice on the right to counter the voices on the left, to push him kind of in the direction of, of the right, which I think happened with Islamic radicalism and disappeared as soon as the left. And again, it's not just the left. I, I, I'm convinced that he got phone calls from, from Saudi Arabia and from Iraq and you know, from the prime minister of Lebanon, who he, he was trying to protect during the war between Israel and Hezbollah. And, and how can he stand up against that? I mean, the whole purpose of the war is to defend the democratically elected government of Iraq. Um, yeah, I want to say something. Uh, I have an even more dim view of the term fascism and why it's being used. Um, it goes back to, its prevalent use goes back to World War II. <clears throat> and the Nazis were called fascists. And they were called fascists in order to try to differentiate them from what they were, were socialists, <clears throat> so that we could preserve the ideal of socialism, but say, well, somehow it's become perverted by the Nazis. When they openly said, we're a socialist and we're taking it to its logical ex extreme, and they did take socialism to its logical extreme. <clears throat> what I, I was actually reading today the, the national strategy for combating terrorism, and fascism is used there, and it's used in the context of the discussion of Islam and of Muslims, and it's used um, to try to draw a distinction between the, the Islamic fascists who take religion and completely distort it. So it's, the, the term fascist is to sever the relationship, it, to, to make it impossible for someone to even ask the question, is there a relationship between their advocacy of religion and their advocacy of force, that they want to shove it down our throats? And it's, no, it's, this is a distorted, it has nothing to do with religion. That is, so the term fascism is used to, in the same way it was used for the Nazis. Well, this is some crazy movement. It has nothing to do with the actual ideas they espouse, which is religious ideas. <clears throat> and Bush, because he's so uh, incredibly religious, can't entertain the idea that s there could be something a matter with religion. And if it's taken consistently, consistently, it leads to a massive use of force on innocent people. So I, I think it, it, is, it is a deliberate term um, and deliberately used to confuse people and to sever, to, to make it such that you can't ask the question, does their religion have something to do with what they're doing. Um, well, there's more to say, but I'll say at least that. Um, first, uh, I gotta say that your comparison to World War II I think is kind of false because Germany and Japan attacked other countries, they were aggressive. And as far as I know, Osama's always been saying that what he wants is the West to stop interfering in the politics of his land, the Middle East. He was against our presence in Saudi Arabia, you know, things like the Shah and stuff like that. So given that, if, if we allow these people to vote and they say vote in some terrorists like from Hamas or Hezbollah, um, that's their choice. And, you know, isn't that the way, like even in Israel, um, didn't many Israeli leaders get their start in the Stern Gang, Near Gun or Leti? I think it's the correct pronunciation. But what if we just pulled out and we let them ha choose their own government and then we trade with them? Look at Vietnam. When we finally pulled out, Vietnam's one of our biggest trading partners. So, you know, to me, it's like they want us to stop interfering in their country. They brought the fight to us. So what if we just pull out? Well, 
that is a complete perversion of what they stand for. Uh, Bin Laden uh, uses the presence of U.S. troops uh, and the presence of Americans uh, in the Gulf states and elsewhere as an excuse to go after it. Their goal is not to get rid of American troops. Indeed, American troops are no longer in Saudi Arabia, in the holy places. Um, if Israel ceased to exist tomorrow, uh, they, would, they would fight us somewhere else. They would go to Greece. They would go to Bosnia. Uh, they would go to uh, Austria, which used to be part of the Islamic empire. Uh, and indeed, their interpretation of, of the, their religion is a commandment to bring Islam to the entire world. I mean, that's how, how did, how did Islam spread from, uh, from being uh, in a tiny little uh, desert oasis um, in, uh, you know, 660 or whatever it was, uh, AD, to uh, being an empire that went from Spain all the way to India, uh, past India, by the 1100, through conquest, because that is their means. That is the essence of their ideology. Uh, your, what you're t wait, let me, let me, I mean, what's the point? Um, what you're reading is a few lines of Bin Laden that the press would like you to read, but read him. Read everything that he writes. Read what their intellectuals write. Read what Said could write, the intellectual, the spiritual father of the whole Islamist movement today. Read what their real intention is. And their real intention, they don't hide this. They don't hide this. We choose to evade it. But their intention, clearly stated, is to establish an, a, an Islamic empire taking over the entire Middle East uh, that would then, once it got established and became powerful, launch a war against the West, eradicate the West. Uh, they want to destroy America because America is a, is, is a symbol of everything that is immoral and, uh, and wrong about the world. They hate us because of who we are, because we're free, because we're prosperous. And, and again, read them. Read them. Don't take my word. Read what they write about America and why they hate us. They don't say, you know, they hate us because we're secular. They hate us because we have separation of church and state. They hate us because we're wealthy, because we're successful, in spite of the fact that we have separation of church and state. Um, so they, in that sense, they're nihilistic. They hate us for everything that's good about us. But they are committed to a worldwide movement to take over the world. Um, and they're no different in that sense from the Nazis and the fascists and the communists. Um, and the only way to stop them, because they believe God is on their side and they, and they, are, you know, they don't mind dying, because 72 virgins or whatever waiting for them, the only way is to destroy them first. If we backed out... They would take over the Middle East. They would vote themselves in. They would have nuclear weapons. Pakistan already has nuclear weapons. It's this close to falling into the hands of the militants. Iran is going to have nuclear weapons soon. And then what do you do? And they don't mind using it because they want to die. They don't care about dying. They're not like the communists. The communists, you know, didn't mind killing other people, but they didn't want to die themselves. These guys want to die. They want to, they want to die in the service of Allah because that gets them into heaven. That's... that's And we have trade relations from Vietnam because Vietnam turned away from communism. It rejected communism in the last 10 years, and, and we have trade relations. But it didn't reject communism because we left. And Vietnam never had an ideology. I'm against the Vietnam War. We should have never been there because Vietnam, qua Vietnam, never had an ideology of saying, we're going to cross the ocean and come to the United States and attack America and blow up America and destroy it. They wanted to enslave their own people. Let them enslave their own people. As I said, I'm not willing to go fight for other people's freedom. But, uh, but, but these people want to cross the ocean to come and destroy us. They want to kill us. They'll do anything to kill us. Yes. Uh, you've identified an important uh, source of danger to the United States, which is the encouragement of faith-based democracy in the Middle East. But we have an administration whose domestic policies are centered on promoting faith-based democracy in the United States and on removing constitutional barriers to faith-based democracy at home. And in fact, the first use of anti-terrorism legislation that permitted the government to seize library records to monitor internet and telephone conversation in the name of fighting terrorism 
has been the faith-based war on obscenity and the faith-based war on drugs and the faith-based war on gambling. So don't you see that there is a consistent, integrated promotion of faith-based democracy at home, which is far more dangerous to the freedoms of Americans than the promotion of the same faith-based democracy in the Middle East. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that Bush's whole agenda is based on religion, but I think it's one and the same issue. The same reason that he brings faith-based programs into domestic policy is the reason that his foreign policy is so altruistic. It's, he cannot, um, I mean, I think one of the main things in terms of having moral confidence and of self-righteously saying that we're in the good here and the regimes in the Middle East are in the wrong is to tell them that <clears throat> you need a separation of church and state, that this, what the Islamic totalitarians are after is precisely religion to have political power. <clears throat> and to defeat that movement, you have to say that goal, the goal of religion having political power is corrupt. <clears throat> and it's thoroughly corrupt, it is un-American, and anyone who takes up arms for that goal will be met with death. <clears throat> and that is the lesson. There is an ideological lesson that you have to drive home to these people, that if you take up arms in the cause of religion having political power, you're going to be met with American bombs. But precisely because Bush believes that religion should have political power, he can never say that. And so he can never oppose the actual source of those attacking us and the ideology of those attacking us. Whatever terminology he uses and however uh, often he refers to Islam because he makes a distinction between those who pervert the religion of Islam and those who willfully and properly carry it out. And he's in support of the second. And he's explicitly in support of the second. And we've poured tens of millions of dollars into what they call the Muslim World Outreach Program. We fund mosques all over the Middle East. We preserve the Quran, uh, old editions of it, because they, they, they want these religious texts. And, oh, well, religion is part of what will bring them freedom, is what he thinks. So it's, they're one and the same issue. His belief that religion should have political power is precisely why his foreign policy is so corrupt. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't take anything I said to imply that uh, uh, we're sanguine or, or accepting of, uh, of the slow deterioration and the separation of church and state in the United States. Of course, that is a huge threat to American liberty. Uh, but, to, you know, you, you, one has to be careful in evaluating which is the greater threat when you've got thousands of kids dying overseas. That, to me, and you've got a powerful enemy, or not so powerful, we're making it powerful, but an enemy who is dedicated to killing us, to me that is the more urgent thing that has to be addressed right now and, and quickly. Let me also say about the use of the uh, Patriot Act and, and the very listening in, which I think, uh, which I am against. I'm not against it at a time of war, but the problem is that there is no defined war here. What I think should have happened, can still, and still can happen, is for the United States to declare war, which requires an act of Congress. We haven't done this since World War II. By the way, maybe that's why we haven't won a war since World War II. Um, declare war, and then put in emergency provisions for the duration of the war. Define what victory means. Go after victory. And once the, once the war is over, I mean, sometimes you have to listen into people. You have to do things that you wouldn't do in peacetime. Once the war is over, the emergency provisions go, go away. But what's scary about what they're doing now is is that this is indefinite. Bush has said this war is unwinnable, or he said that it will last a very, very long time, decades. And in the meantime, we're supposed to live under emergency provisions for decades. And that is very, very dangerous to our own individual liberties. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I enjoyed your talk, and I agree with uh, just about everything you said except one thing. And that is, we've been here for an hour and a half, and I never heard anybody say the word oil. You know, I believe everybody believes we're, we went over there for oil, number one. 
And uh, you never mentioned that. You said we went over to spread democracy. Well, I think because, that was the secondary thing. Well, let, so let me address that. I don't believe we went over there for oil. I wish we had. Um, <laughs> oil, oil to me is a legitimate reason to go to the Middle East, and I don't think we went there for that. The fact is that we've spent almost no, there's almost no American troops dedicated, or, or, or at least there's, a, there's not enough troops dedicated to defending the Iraq, Iraqi oil fields and the refineries and so on. Instead, we're training police forces we're providing, you know, uh, building hospitals and schools. If, if we really cared only about oil, 140,000 American troops would now be surrounding the oil fields. All production in Iraq would be going through the roof. It's not, because we don't care about oil, because that would be selfish. And we don't believe in selfishness. Uh, hello, I enjoyed your talk greatly th this evening. Um, let me, let me just add to that. I really believe they believe this stuff. I know uh, nobody does, but when they talk about the forward strategy of freedom, they, if you read this, the, the administration's materials, all the strategy for victories, which come out every six months, different ones, and then if you go back into the 90s and you read the neoconservatives and other conservative thinkers, they really believe that defeating, that, that bringing democracy to Iraq, allowing elections, will overturn the Middle East, that it will become a flourishing, wonderful place if only we allow the vote. They, they, I mean, this is, these, the intellectuals were advocating for this in the mid-90s of overthrowing Saddam Hussein and bringing elections to Iraq. Uh, you know, in the mid-90s, you can read this. This is, and, and you got, this is the real intellectual agenda because it's consistent with a moral ideal of altruism oil or any of these other supposedly cynical reasons. I mean, I wish because then it would mean that at least they had a semblance of self-interest motivating them and they don't. They're really committed. Um, and I mean, for Bush, it's clear when you read his speeches that it's, he views the people in the Middle East as religious and therefore basically good and therefore they have to have corrupt leaders and if we just remove Saddam Hussein, they'll all vote for freedom. And that, I mean, that is whole strategy is premised on that view. <clears throat> yeah. Um, when we went into Iraq and we were giving them, uh, doing the nation building, I was saying, oh great, what's the best way to start a nation? Well, let's use the US Constitution. And it's like, oh, they're gonna decide all this on their own? Um, our politicians, every single one of them for the most part, don't seem to know what America stands for anymore. Uh, what, as you eloquently stated in a lot of your talk, why America exists and what, that we should promote it. Um, what happened? I mean, it's, I know it's been a lot of years where America has deteriorated to where a socialist, borderline Marxist kind of uh, state uh, in a lot of our philosophies, there's still freedom there. Um, how did it all deteriorate and how do we get it back? Well, I mean, it's, it's basically altruism has become more and more dominant in the culture. It's become more and more prevalent. It's become more and more explicit. Um, there's been a battle in uh, the America psyche, American psyche, if there's such a thing, the American culture, between an American sense of life grounded in the founding of this country, grounded in the entrepreneurial um, nature of kind of 19th century rugged individualist Americans, a sense of life that was fundamentally selfish, self-interested, pursuing one's own dream. The American dream was not about bringing democracy to other people, it was about making your life the best that it can be, about helping your kids have, you know, have a better life than you had, you know, about progress, about the future, about, uh, but fundamentally selfish, fundamentally self-interested. But the explicit morality held in this country, and in every country, because there's never been an alternative to it, was altruism. I mean, you see this in the Founding Fathers. On the one hand, you have Thomas Jefferson writing that we all have an alienable right to our own pursuit of happiness. And on the other hand, he's writing about the morality of altruism and the morality of self-sacrifice in his other writings. Um, there is the split. And what happens is that the explicit ideas, the explicit ideology slowly grinds away at that sense of life and slowly chips away at it. And I think particularly since the late 19th century, early 20th century, that process has really been in play as European philosophy, Kantian philosophy has been brought into the United States. You know, the left has come to dominate our universities and they've just chipped away at the American sense of life and, and 
and that explicit philosophy has become more and more prevalent. You see that in the growth of government, you see it in socialism, you see it all around us, and, and ultimately you see it in our foreign policy, and, and we, we've basically lost much of it. Americans still have it, but, but it's shallow. You, you saw it after September 11th with the flags out for three weeks, and then they were gone. You saw with that urgency for action, but then it was gone because that explicit altruism kicked in and kicked it out. Um, and Ayn Rand writes a lot about this, um, on this whole issue of w how the decay of America occurred. And it's, in philosophical terms, the way she puts it is that morality is more fundamental in politics. <clears throat> the America's founders were political revolutionaries. They were the best political philosophers and politicians the world has ever seen. And they created an unprecedented nation that protects individuals' rights, his, his right to life, to liberty, and to happiness. And these are all selfish. But the selfishness is implicit. When you say the pursuit of happiness, it means the pursuit of your own happiness. And for that to be a moral ideal, you need some kind of morality that will say, look, it's right, it's good, this is the ultimate good, this is the ultimate value, this is what you should be doing, your whole life should be dedicated to achieving your happiness. But you need that as an explicit moral statement. And pre Ayn Rand, there is nobody, there is literally nobody who would say that, who had the courage to say that that is moral. <clears throat> there are basically two egoists, that is two people who advocate selfishness in the history of Western thought as morally ideal. And that's Aristotle and Ayn Rand. And you needed somebody in the 19th century who would stand up and say and develop a new rational moral code. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't happen until the 20th. But unfortunately, it happened in the 20th. So. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Brooks, I agree with your, your point that if we're going to fight a war, we need to, uh, we need to defeat the enemy and I also agree that uh, there are things that we should do, such as uh, in World War II, uh, declared war, and uh, you mentioned. And another thing uh, you also mentioned, and that was uh, using atomic weapons if absolutely necessary. And I think the argument was that it, it was and that it saved a lot of lives. I wouldn't be here personally to ask the question I want to ask if, if, uh, if that hadn't been done. Um, and I've never felt any guilt about that, but there are people that I discuss this with who seem to think that I should, and maybe you can help out a little bit here. They use words like uh, mass murder and genocide and uh, uh, mass slaughter, and, and I looked up genocide because I wanted to ask you this, and it basically just means killing a large number of people. Now, Ayn Rand wrote that using altruism as a justification for mass slaughter was obscene or evil or something, and I agree with that. However, in your opinion, is there a good rationale, a good justification in terms of self-interest or egoism for using weapons of mass destruction? Yes. <laughs> the preservation of your own life uh, in a war of self-defense. That is, if somebody attacks you, it is your moral responsibility to defend your life by whatever means necessary. You owe the other side nothing. You owe the other side nothing. <laughs> and it is, it is um, I'm not sure about your definition of genocide. I think, it, I think it's something different. But, Sure, mass, in this case, mass killing, I wouldn't call it murder because it's killing in self-defense, can be the way in which you defend yourself. In some cases, like, like in the dropping of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was a very effective way in which one protected ourselves. Uh, and the only consideration is your own life uh, and the fact that, that this is necessary for that and this country is a country that attacked you. Um, and let me add about this notion that, well, you know, there were children there and there were uh, women and there were men, you know, who didn't participate in the battles. I, I mean, if, if children are truly innocent die, that's sad. You know, nobody likes to see that happen. But it's not your fault. 
It's the fault of the people who brought you to that situation. It is the fault of the people who initiated force. Every death in, uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is the fault of the Japanese. Every death in Dresden and Hamburg and Berlin is the fault of the Nazis. It is not the fault of America. Uh, so it's their moral responsibility if they are true innocents. But then, most people are not innocent. Most people are not innocent. They actively support the regime. You can see that in the Middle East right now, where a majority is voting for Islamic totalitarians. The majority is our enemy if they support Islamic totalitarianism. But it's more than that. They work for the regime. They, uh, they fund it. They provide the labor for it. Um, they are part of the country. And you cannot isolate certain individuals when you're fighting a war. Your only priority is your own victory, is the lives of your own troops. That's it. So do you think then that people are using some of these terms uh, almost like package deals then? Well, it's, it's they're appealing to altruism. It's the appealing to their lives are more important than your life. It, you know, a million Japanese lives are more important than a hundred American lives. So, you know, they play a numbers game on you, but it's not a numbers game. It's a question of your life, of American freedom. It's not a question of, of, of their lives. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that last point is really important, that morality is not a numbers game. If you have the right to kill one Japanese in self-defense, you have the right to kill a 50 or a 100 or a 1,000, or however many necessary to defend yourself. And if it was wrong to kill a 1,000 or a 100,000, then it's wrong to kill one. There's, there's no, it doesn't somehow become, well, we've killed 50, that's okay, but if we kill 100, all of a sudden, it, it, morality is not a numbers game in that way. It is, but it is for altruists. And, and, and that's the perversity of we won't use nuclear weapons or we won't use chemical weapons or whatever. I mean, that's ridiculous. You use whatever weapon is the most effective to deal with the problem, the problem of self-defense that you encounter at that moment. The, 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 use the weapons that will solve your problem, that will lead to your victory. Uh, so we won't use nuclear weapons that might kill, let's say, 100,000 people, but we use lots of tiny little bombs that will kill 100,000 people. I mean, that's, that, that, that's exactly the, the, the ridiculous nature of the argument. And, and uh, you know, so we can kill, uh, we can bomb one uh, school, but we can't bomb 10 schools. I mean, it, it's not a numbers game. You have a right to your own self-defense. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed your talk. It seems like this could be a subject that we can discuss all night, and I know we're limited. But uh, through your talk, it, sa it seems to me that you agree with uh, sending American troops into Iraq. No. You do not? No, because I, I think Iraq was the wrong country. I, I, don't, I don't oppose necessarily going to Iraq, but in this war, uh, it, was, it was the wrong target. Uh, there was no, it wasn't necessary. It was, it was a waste. We should have gone to Iran. I said that a number of times during the talk. I'm sorry, I misinterpreted. I, I don't believe we should have gone in there if we did, when we did, and found out there were no weapons of mass destruction. We should have gone home, just but like we weapons of mass destruction are not the issue. That's not the issue in this war. Lots of countries that are hostile to the United States have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the point is, is, the question is, when you go to war, the question you have to ask is, who is the enemy? And what is the most effective way to deal with that enemy? The enemy is Islamic totalitarianism, and therefore the most effective way to deal with the enemy is to destroy the Iranian regime. Iraq was led by Saddam Hussein, who was a thug. He was nothing but a two-bit thug. And as soon as America had, had been clear on its willingness to use force, he would have been eliminated as a threat to the United States. Uh, it's uh, been stated, and I just read it again this week, that uh, it's almost impossible to uh, win a guerrilla war because the combatants look exactly the same as the non-combatants. Just like, how do you tell the difference between a North Vietnamese and a South Vietnamese, or a North Korean or a South Korean? So this, it seems that this war just cannot be won because there's no country that we could attack. Well, what there is, I named it Iran, and I named it a Saudi Arabia, but even the insurgency can be won. It's not hard to win the insurgency. Three weeks, max. Even though you don't know who the, the combatants are? Why does that bother you? Well, 
clearly, every- clearly the insurgents, I mean, today it's more complicated because the insurgents are on both sides and everybody wants to kill Americans. Right, it's a civil war. But, but a, a year ago, the insurgents were Sunni Arabs living in the Sunni triangle, being hidden, financed, supported, uh, you know, fed, clothed by Sunni Muslims in cities like Fallujah and Samara and, and others. You know, I, I advocated at the time, and I think it would have worked very effectively to take a city like Fallujah, a town like Fallujah, and flatten it. You're supporting these, you're supporting these insurgents. You're supporting terrorism. You are responsible, as responsible for it as the terrorists are. We're flattening it. We'll flatten every city in the Sunni triangle until this stops. And believe me, you flatten one city, they'll turn against their own, and they'll stop the insurgency immediately. I know other people have said that, and I agree with that also. Even the soldiers. It's been proved to start. That have been and the, Marines, the Marines know this. There's no question. That's how we did in the Philippines in the turn of the century. And it's not hard to do. You have to be brutal. You have to be tough. You, and you, you know, how did Sherman stop the Civil War? He burnt their plantations. He burnt their crops. He destroyed their homes. He didn't even kill that many people. But he made the civilian population of the South suffer so that they didn't want war anymore. So they wrote to their troops and told them, stop. You know, you don't even have to flatten the city. Starve them. Burn all their crops. Don't allow any traffic on their roads. Just, just bomb every truck that travels on the road, every car that travels on the road until, they, until there's no transportation, and, and let them turn against the insurgents, kill them, and then they'll come to us on their knees asking us to forgive them, and, and what can they do for us then? Well, you know, that's how you deal with an enemy. That's what war is about. <clears throat> well, Don't I, go to war otherwise. Well, Stay home. I have a moral... Uh, it's not that, that is I, the moral response. That is the moral well, thing well, to do. Well, that's your opinion. It's moral response. I don't, well, in every, uh, what do you call it, embargo, the people that suffer are not the soldiers. They're the, the, the civilians. The, the people who feed, clothe, fund, and harbor the soldiers. They may what not it make? feed, clothe, and harbor the soldiers. Somebody does, right? It's a civilian population of the country that does. What, you mean uh, 100% of the population in Iran? Uh, no, but is- a significant proportion of it does. And again, as I said before, the people who suffer, who are not feeding and clothing the soldiers, suffer because the Iranian regime is an evil regime. Their moral responsibility is not on your hands trying to defend yourself, but on Iran for trying to engage us in a war. That and that's is. true of the Iraqis as well. The, the responsibility of the deaths in Fallujah are not on us. They're on the insurgents who are fighting us because we're bringing them freedom. Well, I agree with that. I guess where I disagree with you, it is in the, uh, what, uh, the extent of. <laughs> it's not a numbers game, as Dr. Gartes said before. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be one of the innocents that, uh, you know, that no, and I get, get run over wants by to a tank. Just, I want to add one thing to that. I think the attitude of innocence in Iraq would be pro-American. Indeed, I think that's a necessary condition of being innocent. If you have the, I mean, leave aside a one-year-old, but if you have the capacity to know what's going on, you would be in favor of the U.S. crushing the insurgency, even if that means the loss of some innocent, truly innocent life, people who are against everything that Iraq and the Islamic totalitarians stand for, in the same way that the freedom fighters in World War II welcomed American bombing. Um, so I, I think even on the level of worrying about innocence, you're completely wrong of what a truly innocent person would think. And the partisans in Europe died under American bombing, but they welcomed it, and they helped make it possible by providing targets. And some of them died in the effort, because that's what truly innocents do. They, they, they work to defeat the, the, the hostile regime, and they encourage those who are going to ultimately free them. I mean, the truly innocent in Iraq should be rallying to America's side and helping them root out the insurgents and kill them. And if they don't do that, they're not innocent. I mean, imagine what your reaction would be if, you were, if some killer made you a shield for him going around and killing people. You would say to the people being killed, you have a right to defend yourself. You should shoot back. If I get hit in the process, it's too bad, but the responsibility is for this person who's made me a shield, not for the people fighting back. That I agree with. That one of the points is, though, that they're all Muslims. Okay? We're considered Christians. 
Okay? If we bomb and kill 10,000 Muslims, they don't need to pray. Okay? The Christians killed the Muslims. I don't think they're going to say, hey, they're trying, the Christians are trying to uh, free us. This, this is a... a Okay, this is, you know, this brings up this issue of, you know, if you're too brutal with them, what will happen is you encourage hate. They'll hate you even more. I hear this all the time. If you, if you bomb, if you go after Iran and you bomb Iran, you'll just make the Muslims angry at the United States and they'll come after us. So I want to read you something. Uh, this is um, because what's interesting to me is we dropped a bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, atomic bombs, killed 150,000 Japanese, and the Japanese are not pissed off at us. And, and I want to read you, I want to read you, this is a General MacArthur writing right after World War II. Uh, he's in Japan and he's describing the state of mind of the Japanese, right? And this is what he writes. And this is the effect of real victory on them, of really crushing them. This is the effect on them. They suddenly felt the concentrated shock of total defeat. Their whole world crumbled. It was not merely the overthrow of their military might. It was the collapse of a faith. It was the disintegration of everything they had believed in and lived by and fought for. It left a complete vacuum, morally, mentally, and physically. And into this vacuum flowed the democratic way of life, or I would add, the American way of life. Now, if we had an American general who could write this well, and it was in command, I mean, who had this kind of ideas, these kind of ideas, it would have been all over three months after September 11th. You don't need to spend six years fighting this war. And he, MacArthur understood, and he understood what, why Japan could turn. It could turn because it had been humiliated, because it had been crushed. And that humiliation and, and that defeat didn't cause the Japanese to hate us, it caused them to question everything. It caused a complete intellectual vacuum into which we could then bring our ideas. And that's what we need to do here. We need to completely crush their belief in Islamic totalitarianism, their belief in, in religion and state as combined, their belief in their own culture. We need to show them that their culture is what it is, a culture of death. And once a, a, a culture of impotence. And once they are completely, they completely reject that culture, then you can approach them with better and new ideas, but not before that. And you do that, on, you know, the only way to do that is by killing a lot of people. That's what war is about. And I know, you know, nobody likes to say it, so I'm the guy who gets to say it all the time. But that's what needs to be done. There's no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. We've tried in Iraq the shortcut of not killing anybody, and all that happens is Americans die. My turn now. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for a very informative discussion on the eve of, uh, you know, September 11th. Um, you identified two nation states as being uh, targets um, and as being behind uh, or financing the radical Islamist extremism. Um, my question to you is, there's been a number of developments. Um, basically showing that uh, the Al-Qaeda threat, the extremist threat has been splintering and it now, um, now there's a presence in many countries, not only Iran, not only Saudi Arabia, not only the Middle East, we now have it in Northern Africa. They are, uh, you know, you have uh, terrorist threats coming out of the UK, out of Canada, you have splinter groups in Miami. Um, there's a lot of frightening stories that, um, I just read one in The Economist where, um, Anyone with a biology degree and $50,000 in funding can basically create a, a lab in their bedroom or a lab in their garage and create all sorts of, you know, horrible things. So, sure, we have identifiable nations that can be, you know, they, they're probably financing a, a large chunk of this rad, radicalism. And if you eliminate them, sure, that will decrease. However, how would you address the fact that there are so many enemies so many extremists in, you know, little pockets here and there all over the world, including Canada, the U.S., Australia, um, allies, and, and how would you go after them without encroaching on the personal freedoms that we uh, value so greatly? Well, what are they after? What are, what are, what are these terrorists in London and in uh, Denmark and 
in the U.S. probably, and, and uh, many, many of these countries, what are they after? Uh, what, are they, uh, what inspires them? What gets them going? What gets them motivated? What inspires them is the example that the Iranian regime provides, a successful, so-called successful, Islamic totalitarian state. What, what, they, what they goal is, is to bring more Iwans into existence. Because look, we, we've got one, we want more of them. We want an Islamic state over the entire world. Um, they have particular goals. One of the purposes of defeating Iran and Saudi Arabia is to show them that those goals are unattainable. They don't have a chance to ever see an Islamic uh, totalitarian state survive because the United States will not tolerate it. So then they have to ask the question, what are we fighting for? Now, some of them are com you know, have completely lost it. They're nihilists. They're, they're out to fight America for the sake of killing Americans. They don't care about anything else. And those people you have to hunt down and kill. But most of them, I don't think, are like that, or at least not the people sitting on the fence that they haven't been radicalized yet. Those people do it because they believe they can actually attain an Islamic totalitarian world, an Islamic totalitarian caliphate, and that's what you have to persuade them that is unachievable. And you don't do that in London. You do that by going to the Middle East and showing them that the few examples where it succeeded for a while have been eliminated, have been eradicated. There's nothing there anymore. Also note that every time one of these groups is caught in London, they discover that they've been to Pakistan, <laughs> right? I mean, they all were, right? They always. So they don't think up this stuff by themselves. I mean, it's rare, like the, the, the guy who shot at the Jewish, uh, th um, uh, Jewish uh, uh, Congress, I think, in, in Seattle. A guy goes nuts, you know, is radicalized. He's an individual. He goes and he shoots a bunch of Jews. Uh, but that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about organized, sophisticated terrorist activity. That is all guided by central authority out of al-Qaeda from Pakistan. Uh, the same thing happened with the uh, London bombing of the um, subways. They linked the people back. Don't underestimate the role of the Al-Qaeda infrastructure and the role of the funding and the organization and the, and the um, material support that is provided by countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia. So, so you think all they the are pretty centralized then? There's a few locations that... I still believe Al-Qaeda is pretty cell centralized. I think this whole idea of individual cells, even the Madrid cell was linked to the Moroccan cell, which had links to, to you know, Pakistan and to, and to, to the rest of the Middle East and Al-Qaeda. Uh, and even, again, those who are really isolated are st still striving towards an Iran. And, and a Saudi Arabia, and if you eliminate those, what are they striving towards? They've got nothing to fight for. I'll just ask one final question, because I'm sure this, this could be add. a very long discussion. But yeah, well, so do you, let, yeah, oh, Dr. Okay. Glatzer just wanted to sure. add to that. And um, it's, <clears throat> you have to make a distinction between that they're willing to fight to the death for a goal, and that they don't care about their own deaths. The fact that they are willing to commit suicide remains that they're willing to commit suicide in the cause, in for a cause, and if you strike at the cause and convince them through your actions that the cause is doomed, they will no longer be willing to commit suicide for nothing. It's the same. There, there was a similar argument in regard to what to do with the Japanese because they were fighting to the death and they were having suicide attacks, and so long as they th thought the cause of Japan is a legitimate cause that has a possibility of success, even if I'm dead. The cause still has a possibility of success. They fought to the death, but when Japan was humiliated and the emperor was humiliated and the whole cause that they were fighting for was discredited, you no longer had them willing to die for nothing. It's the same thing here. It's, there are many people, they can recruit many people willing to commit suicide for the cause. If you strike at the cause, they will no longer be able to recruit those people. But is it really that easy? I mean, can't they just go to Syria? What if, what if there's an attack on Iran? Can't the powers that be kind of shift elsewhere and hide? You have I mean, to do it until the cause is destroyed. And if they do shift, you have to destroy Syria. Okay, and what about U.S. resources? Do we have, do you really think that we have enough resources to truly do all that? If we fight the war properly, if we don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of troops securing sewers, sewers and schools and social services to these countries, then absolutely. I don't think, I don't think there's any problem. I, I like to say that 
you know, Patton with three Alma divisions could take the Middle East in three months. I mean, Israel probably could. Israel do. could. I mean, if, if, if they really fought a war properly, not like the way they fought the Hezbollah. This is not, you're not talking about real armies here. I mean, the, think about World War II. You, you were fighting two mighty industrial nations. Germany and Japan had factories. They, they built the, 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 the and before the U.S. entered, the best airplanes, the best aircraft carriers. They, they built all the weapons they fight with. There's not a single weapon in the Middle East that wasn't purchased from the West or from, or from the Soviets. But they produce nothing. They, were, they, were, they, are, they live in caves. The equivalent of living caves. There is no industry. There is no economy. They, all they have is oil, which they stole from us to begin with, and they get dollars from us. All they have is oil. They have nothing else. There is no opponent. I mean, if we fought seriously. I mean, think of just the Iraq-Iran war, where mil millions on both sides were killed. We can beat Iraq in three weeks if we want. I mean, so there's nothing there if we took military action. What's hampering us is not... Um, insufficient military resources. What's happening, hampering us is insufficient moral resources. Okay, okay great, thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I enjoyed the speech very much. Um, uh, the bulk of the time that you were speaking was demonstrating how the current altruistic uh, practices of the American government aren't going to solve the war on terrorism. Um, so you suggested that we need to destroy the enemy. You cited World War I, World War II. Not one. No, not World War I, because that wasn't very successful when we destroyed Germany that time. Well, we didn't destroy Germany. That was the problem. Um, well, we can take, get into the discussion came of close. World War I the, the, if you want. The result of that was, because of how it was handled, we ended up with World War II about 20 years later. Um, what, what's the battle plan? What's the game plan? We're here. We're going to change the government. Uh, we're going to put your plan into action. We're going to attack Iran. Okay. World uh, War II, let, we were let me, let me first deal with conflict. World War I, because I, I do think it's an interesting historical uh, question. Uh, what happened in World War I? What, why was Germany uh, ready within uh, 20 years to launch another world war? Uh, and I believe, uh, and, you know, I believe that the reason was that Germany was not crushed in World War I. I believe that Germany, the peace agreement with Germany was way too uh, beneficial to the Germans. Now, I'm against, I was against, I'm against U.S. ever having gone into World War I, put that aside. But, but it was far, more far too generous to the Germans, the peace agreement. Um, countries, as a consequence, Germany took away from World War I, the soldiers returning from the front had the attitude of, we could have won it. Our generals messed up. We didn't have enough patriotism, or we didn't have enough tanks, or we didn't have enough something. But we could have won this. Just a little bit more, and we would have gotten it. And that created an environment that was ready for the Nazi party. Now, there are other causes. I mean, you should read the ominous parallels by Lenin Pico for the philosophical causes for World War II. But I think that the, the specific existential cause was the fact that World War I didn't do what World War II did. World War II crushed the Germans. The Germans were like I described the Japanese here. They were completely humiliated. And, and Nazism as an ideology was completely um, destroyed. And as a consequence, the Germans were open to change, which they weren't after World War I. After World War I, everything just continued normally. Um, the battle plan. Um, I think I've laid down most of the battle plan already. Um, I'm not a, a general. I, I'm certainly not an expert in military strategy to give you the play-by-play -play scenario. Um, although, you know, I could make something up, which would kind of be fun. But, um, but right now, uh, as I said in my talk, I would abandon Iraq. Um, I would uh, abandon Iraq in the sense of taking all 140,000 troops uh, to the Iranian border. Um, I would uh, bring whatever aircraft carriers you needed into the Persian Gulf. Uh, I would give the Iranian regime 48 hours to fly themselves to the, the property they have in Toronto, um, <laughs> which they won't. Um, and then I would invade. And, but as I said in the talk, I would um, use all force necessary if, if uh, that meant that the military expert believed that flattening Tehran was necessary. I would flatten Tehran. 
um, if, uh, if it meant flattening Qum. I, I would actually vote for flattening Qum. Qum is the religious center for Shiite Islam and, and the religious center for uh, Sistani and for Khatami and for all these, all these ayatollahs and mullahs. Um, it's where they preach this stuff. It's where they develop this ideology. Uh, then you flatten that city. You do whatever is necessary to, to destroy the Iran. And I think I've said in the past, after you do that, if you discover that Iran is like some people believe, this haven for, West, for the West where the population is just craving for freedom, fine, hand it over to them. If not, then uh, give them the infrastructure their philosophy deserves. That is, destroy every bridge, every dam, every power plant, every semblance of Western technology into the entire country. Put, uh, put troops to protect the oil field and get out. And let them sort the rest out. After that, what you do, there are lots of options. It depends on what the rest of the Muslim world does. But you might go into Afghanistan and into Pakistan to hunt down bin Laden. You might have to put some troops in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. You might have to deal with Syria. I doubt it. I don't think you'd have to do any of that. I think after you do that to Iran, the Saudis would come groveling because they only exist at our be because we let them. So basically, you want us to go in more or less unprovoked? Unprovoked? <laughs> in my view, no, let me, let the, me, the let me answer that. Let me answer that. Be unprovoked, um, I believe we have been in, with, in war with Iran since November 4th, 1979, which was the date they took our embassy. Um, if that wasn't enough, they're respons they are responsible for killing 244 Marines in Beirut in 1983 for killing, I can't remember how many Marines in the Kobo Towers in Saudi Arabia in 1996. They are responsible for spurring terrorism. They are the lead supporter of terrorism in the world. Uh, it, so unprovoked is ridiculous. But if you mean without French support, <laughs> without, UN, without UN support, then absolutely, I think the UN is a travesty and we should pay no attention to it. Now, we do need to build American support. So any president who goes to war needs to convince Americans that it is a justified war. I happen to believe that wouldn't be hard if, the, if, if, if a president, not George Bush, but a president, clearly articulated what's at stake. I don't think that would be a hard thing to do. So you don't see a, a world response developing out of this, just kind of, it's like, yeah, you know, they took care of those Oh, guys. yeah, the French will be pissed off, and so will the Russians, and so will the Chinese, and what will they do? And the Koreans and Pakistanis. The Koreans and Pakistanis. Pakistanis will say, you know, please don't do this to us next, but what will the rest of the world do? That's what what will they do? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What would they do? I, I'll tell you what they'll do. Absolutely nothing. They'll send a few diplomats here and there. They'll scurry around. They'll, they'll negotiate, they'll be upset, and we'll say, we don't really care what you guys think. We did this to defend ourselves. You should thank us, because we have just solved your Chechen problems, Russia, maybe. We have solved the Islamist problem that China has on its western border. Um, you know, if anything, you should be thanking us, because we have just eliminated a massive threat to civilization, all civilization. And, you know, if America suited itself, maybe, I think people would believe it. Thank you. I agree completely with your analysis of the failed strategy and the uh, analogy with World War II. Uh, the young lady's question was similar to mine, but your answer didn't satisfy me. Um, every time I think about this issue more than five minutes, I come up with the same problem. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Ayn Rand said many, Ayn Rand said many times that we're not going to defeat altruism by going to the polls. We're not going to defeat altruism uh, by electing somebody or having a radical revolution in Washington. It's got to start in the classroom, university classrooms. Yet, we're going to defeat radical Islam by crushing Syria or Iran, it seems to me that it's a similar problem. You've got a philosophy there. How do you carpet bomb? How do you crush a radical ideology? Well, I mean, how did we do it with Japan? 
<laughs> the difference is there were no cells of uh, Nazis in South America. At least I didn't know there were no. Sure, they were. Uh, well, First of all, they yes, were, but, but, but that's they not the point. They weren't a similar threat as the. Oh, then if there's cells now. in London, if that is really the problem, then hunt them down and capture them and kill them if necessary. I mean, I'm not against that. I just happen to think it won't be necessary for the reasons Dr. Gatte mentioned. If they don't have a goal for which to aspire to, they will not be radicalized and they will not go out to, to bomb. But I do fundamentally agree with you in this sense. We're not going to have this war as long as America is altruistic. We're not going to have this war unless we change the culture in this country first. We're not going to be able to crush Iran unless we adopt a different philosophy. So the battle is the, the battle Ayn Rand identified, ultimately. It has to be. And that is the battle, the philosophical battle here in America. That is the fundamental. The fundamental is, there's no question, we will not bomb Iran until we change our until they change what we teach at our schools. Words, we won't bomb Iran until we change what we teach at our universities because as long as altruism is prevalent in America, never mind in Tehran, we won't take the sort of ne action necessary to defeat the enemy. In other words, it's not going to happen. I want to say something about the, the, the issue of um, changing their minds by attacking them and somehow dislodging the radical Islam. It's true you're not, you're not going to instill any positive ideas by bombing them. But that's not our obligation, and we don't need to do that in order to be safe. What you need is for them to feel fear, real fear, and an, an, an intellectual fear that if we embrace these ideas and if we advocate for their political expression, we're going to be met with death. And that's what the Japanese got, and that's what the Germans got. They didn't turn all of a sudden into these great egoists. <clears throat> and I think the Germans didn't, and I think the Japanese didn't. But they were scared. We, if we're going to embrace any ideas, it's not going to be these ones. <clears throat> In the case of the Middle East, it really is important to realize what a total zero the Middle East is. You take out Western oil that was discovered, developed, and still produced by Western companies. You take that out of the Middle East, they have nothing. I mean, when's the last time you bought a, a computer, a cell phone, a shirt made in Saudi Arabia? They have literally zero. And if they're scared of embracing Islam and giving it political form because they know we're going to visit bombs upon them, they'll go back to being the total zeros that they are. Um, and they'll go back to their caves and they'll have literally nothing. And there will be nothing to fear from these people. And you don't need to convert them to capitalism or spread freedom and bushes. All you want is for them to feel fear that if we embrace this ideology, that's going to mean our death. I, I, you know, I feel like I need to read the quote from MacArthur again. <laughs> I mean, that's the attitude you want to instill in them, that they are so afraid, that they so realize that their ideology is nothing, that there is a complete intellectual vacuum uh, that they're open to anything but <laughs> a return to, in this case, Islam, Islamic totalitarianism. But, that's, but that has happened in history, and there's no reason to think that it won't. And again, that is even more so with, with uh, Islamic totalitarianism because they have literally nothing. They'll go back to roaming the deserts. I mean, there's nothing else for them to do there. There is nothing other than, you know, change and then they're capable of anything any human being is capable of. But they have to change. If they won't change, then they go back to roaming the deserts, but they're not a threat to us while they roam their deserts on their camels. Now, let me, I, I do have to address the other point that you made, and that is, well, then there's no hope. Well, no, there is hope, and that is the hope to change this culture. And, you know, I think it's wrong to be negative about that, because there really is hope in doing that. And, and because if you give up, you know, I think that we really have an opportunity, have an impact on this culture, because I think that today, in the world we live in, there's a vacuum. There is an ideological vacuum. And people are looking for answers. And you can see that people are looking for answers all around you. They're upset. They don't like what's happening in Iraq. They don't want to stay. They don't want to leave. They, they don't want another September 11th. They want an answer. They want something to happen to help them. They want some new ideas. Every group that I go to, non-objectivists, just groups that I go to and speak about foreign policy, the response is overwhelmingly positive. 
even though if you told them before I arrived that you will be cheering on this and this idea, they'd all go, oh, never, no, no. But once it's laid out to them in a logical fashion, they go, yeah, that's kind of consistent with American sense of life. So there's still hope. And, you know, what, that's what the Institute does. That's what the Ironman Institute's job is. And that's what we spend millions of dollars a year trying to bring about, is a cultural change, is to bring these ideas into classrooms, high school classrooms, to bring them into the universities, to bring them into philosophy and history and political science departments, to bring these ideas ultimately to West Point and to, to the Naval Academy and so on, Air Force Academy. And we are making progress. And, and, uh, but th that's, you know, if you give up hope on that, then, then what's left? But that is, you know, your support. Those of you who support us and those of you who don't should be embarrassed. Um, <laughs> no. You know, you should because, because we are fighting for these values and the fight is winnable. The fight is winnable. It is not a lost case. The America is not doomed. But it is doomed if we don't get these ideas out there. And the only way we can get these uh, ideas out there is with your support. So support us more. I want to add something about uh, you brought up the universities. Um, and certainly that is a significant part of what the Ayn Rand Institute, Institute does, is we try to get better ideas and better teachers and better intellectuals into the universities. But what Ayn Rand said about, I mean, she wrote an article, what can one do? <clears throat> Her answer is speak. <clears throat> and that implies to everyone. It doesn't apply just to the intellectuals. It applies to every single person. If you know the right ideas, if you know that egoism is correct, if you know that this war on terrorism is a travesty of what, compared to what should be done, you need to speak, and you need to speak to every person you meet who you think would listen. <clears throat> the reason we're focused on the universities is basically for an issue of leverage. That is where you meet with young minds who are eager to learn and figuring out a direction in life. And this is, it's usually in the college years that they form a certain philosophy that will then carry them for the rest of their lives. And that is the point at which a small number of people can have a significant impact by teaching and writing. But that is just one form of speaking. It is a highly leveraged form, and that's why we're focused on it. But the more fundamental is to speak, and that applies to every single person. Okay. Next question. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, enjoyed your speech. Thank you. My name is Robert. I consider myself a mainstream American. Sometimes I vote Democrat, sometimes I vote Republican. But um, I, th I would like to uh, point out in your speech um, what you're really concerned with, you're, what you're trying to bring to enlightenment is that the problem we have right now is that there's real no focus on ending this. That's the problem with the Bush administration's policy right now. We don't have a clear focus on ending this when the purpose of war is to defeat the enemy. Yes, yeah, so it's not just ending it. Uh -huh. it's, there's no focus on victory, right. and there never was. So that from day one, there was no focus in the administration on winning the war, on actual victory. victory. But right. the focus was in, uh, instead on how can we benefit the Afghans, how can we benefit the Iraqis. Right. And as a consequence, we fought a war to benefit our enemies, not a war to benefit Americans. Not a war to win. Right. I got a couple questions. Um, my dad was a veteran in World War II. He served in Patton's Army. And, uh, and you're right. I mean, they went in there to win, and they won. And they were defeated. Uh, Japan was defeated. We put restrictions on the amount of money they could spend on military, on defense. And that's why they prospered. Instead, what they did, instead of using that as an excuse for anything, they took the money that they would have spent on defense, and they spent it on their economy. And that's why they're, uh, they're uh, prosperous. Well, let me comment on that, because I don't yeah. think that's true. That is uh, true. No. Yeah. Um, the reason Japan is prosperous is because we uh, forced them uh, on them a constitution that basically leaves Japanese free. I mean, it's still more statism than I would like, but it's basically free. Uh, governments don't create wealth. Uh, it's not through spending less on military that you create wealth anyway. 
Uh, individuals create wealth. Businessmen create wealth. And what we allow Japan is, what, we, what the constitution that we left in Japan allowed is for individuals to go out and create wealth. Uh, and that's why Japan prospered. It was prospered because we left the country free. We left the country, uh, we left a country that respected, at least to some extent, the individual rights of its citizens. In every example in history, in every country, uh, look at the United States. We spent a huge amount of our budget on, on uh, military, but we're incredibly prosperous. Why? Because fun basically, with a lot of limitations, but basically, Americans are free to produce. Americans are free to live the life that they want to live, and therefore they go out and make money, create wealth. We and we implanted that, basically that similar system onto, into uh, Japan, and that's why they're successful, not because of military spending one way or the other. Okay, I, I understand. Um, the point I'm trying to make, okay, so the problem we have here with Al-Qaeda is they attacked us. We, it cost us 3,000 American lives here. And, and we shouldn't forget that, obviously. Um, this, the difference is this is not a political ideology, it's a, a religious ideology. It's, it's Islamic fundamentalism, right? They, they want to attack us for being who we are. And yeah, but that's political. Right. <laughs> that's not, I mean, it's politics driven by religion, but it's still a political ideology. Mm -hmm. If it was just Islamic fundamentalists, they want to go, I don't know, like uh, uh, like monks. They want to go and live in caves. Okay, it's and, political too. Okay, then, but it's but, fundamentally political. Right. That's it's okay. the merger of politics with religion that is the problem. But the basis of their attack is their religion, Islam, Islam, right? Whereas, um, like World War One was basically about colonialism. The the European countries were colonial in in the Middle East and Africa, and they were fighting over. Who, who could have more? Who could, in, in World War II, we oppressed uh, Hitler. He didn't, he didn't uh, we didn't pay attention to him. He built up his military and he decided to take back the land uh, that we took from them. And he took, took Poland. And, uh, and yeah, and well, he went right over Poland and, uh, and then, and then we, we got engaged in World War II. But the Middle East, these countries weren't even developed in the 1940s. We carved them up after, after World War II. That's a bizarre interpretation of World War II. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what the question is, yeah. though. Um, well, the, well the, question, the question is, is that um, um, you, you want us, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought, but um, well, let me try, uh, let me try yeah. to milk the okay. question out. Okay. I mean, if you're trying to say, look, in, in uh, um, you know, in some way this is our fault, or in some, you know, you're even applying the World War II is somehow our fault, um, I just, I think that's, first of all, that's ludicrous. I mean, uh, Hitler was driven by an ideology. Uh -huh. Nazism, that as Dr. Gatte mentioned, is driven, is an ultimate expression of socialism. So, you know, replace socialism with Islam, that's what you have today. It's a particular ideology that drives them. Um, it's an ideology that is political in the sense that it's about political goals, taking over countries, destroying other countries. Right. Okay. That's what drove Hitler and that's what drove them. And the only way to stop that is to show that the ideology is impotent. And you do that by destroying it. You did right. it by destroying Germany and now you need to do it by destroying those countries that exemplify that ideology like you are. Okay, here, I, I remember now exactly what, <laughs> the point I was trying to get to, okay, is that what we need to do is we need to defeat Islamic fundamentalism. They're the enemy, okay? That's what we need to do. Al-Qaeda, like, we need to kill their top leaders and keep killing them until we, and, and what you're seeing we're not going to engage Iran unless they do something against us or against Israel. But as I've said, they've already done yeah. lots of stuff against right. us and lots of stuff against Israel. But the point right. is that Iran is the heart of this Islamic totalitarian right. ideology. Right. And they're the one that are producing. 
the Bin Ladens. They're supporting the Iran They're and Saudi them. and Saudi Arabia. And that's why you have to take out those countries. And Iran and Saudi Arabia exactly. is what you're saying. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Okay, uh, so we need to clearly define the enemy, and we need to defeat the enemy. Exactly. But okay, what what are your comments or any comments that you have on um, the fact that what they're doing with their youth is that they're taking their youth. I mean, I, I understand the faith and I understand theology, you know, but what they're doing with their youth is they're teaching them the Quran. All they do is just teach them the Quran. That's it. They read it over and over and over again. They're teaching them to hate Israel and hate Jews. And ultimately, of course, they want to eliminate Israel. I mean, what kind of victory are we going to have unless we can get into the young minds that are controlled by just Islam and the Quran, is what I'm saying. It's again, the issue is not that we have to win their hearts and minds in the sense of convincing them that we're good. We have to convince them that they're evil, which means that they have to see if we embrace these ideas, it's our death that are gonna happen, not the deaths of America. To the extent that they think we embrace these ideals, and our cause will be advanced, you'll keep getting recruits. <clears throat> so to say that you're targeting Islamic fundamentalism, you're targeting its political expression. We're not, it's not the mission of the US to go and educate everyone in the world. That would be a completely selfless mission. The mission is you're gonna destroy the political manifestation of this. They can believe whatever they want in their caves. They can recite the Quran from uh, morning to evening. It's when they take up arms, that is when they think it's legitimate to force this on other people. That, has, that is the point at which you have to completely demoralize them so that that idea never takes hold in their mind. And you do that by a show of force. It's the same, there are Marxists today. I mean, go into a college classroom and you will meet Marxists. But as a political ideal, that this can gain political power and then it's right that it should gain political power. It's been discredited. And it's the same, you can meet Nazis, but the, the, the political manifestation of it is what the target, that is all the military can do, is it can show if you take up these ideas and you take up arms in their support, we're gonna kill you. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.